Okay, so um, I'm Leishi. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer here at uh, Middlesex University. Um, so um, in this talk, I want to uh, give a brief introduction of uh, some of the techniques that are involved in similarity analysis and uh, uncertainties uh, that may associate it to them. So just give you an impression of what do you need to bear in mind when you do your analysis and uh, um, uh, also not only similarity analysis but many other uh, data analysis tasks. So similarity analysis is a very commonly used technique in uh, data uh, analysis. The idea is to uh, compare the similarity or differences between objects in your data uh, in order to understand some patterns and relations in your data. For example, which objects form a group or which objects uh, could be the outliers in your data, right? So for instance, give a group of uh, fruits. Uh, can you tell which ones are uh, form a cluster and which ones may be outliers? So just by intuition, can, can someone give me a suggestion? Uh, which fruit could be the possible outlier in this uh, collection? Banana. Banana? Could be apple, could be apple yeah. Orange. <laughs> Actually, anyone could be an outlier, depending on what you compare, right? So banana has a different shape. Lemon is probably more sour than the others. And you can name it. So the point I want to make here is, before you start your analysis, you want to start from two questions. What do you want to compare? And how do you compare, right? So um, given the fruit, there are many attributes. You may collect data from many sources, and you may get many, uh, many different types of information. For example, the shape of uh, the fruits, the color. How do you eat these fruits or sweetness? So if we look at the shape, probably banana is the outlier in this fruit connection, but if we look at the corner, somehow um, orange could be the outlier. And if you compare whether you eat this fruit with screen or not, you can see actually you have two different groups. And according to sweetness, a lemon could be the outlier. So in data analysis, we call this focusing. Okay, the focusing is a process of understand your problem. What do you want to analyze? And also, um, you want to uh, analyze what type of information do you need to uh, perform your analysis task, right? Uh, whether this information is available in your data, or if not, how do you handle it? Okay. So if we look at the knowledge discovery process, Focusing is the first stage of the analysis process. So given a large amount of uh, data that you collected or you, you provided, um, how do you uh, refine your research question and identify relevant data so you can focus on smaller subset of information for your analysis that are relevant to your analysis task? Okay. So let's have a look at the uncertainty that uh, could be associated to uh, this focusing stage. So first of all, do you have a clear understanding of the problem? I mean, uh, ideally, you are the domain expert who does the uh, analysis. But in some, other uh, in some scenarios, for example, in biological research, often they have a different group of people called bioinformaticians, right? These are not bi bi uh, biologists. They are not um, pure uh, machine learning people, but they work as a media between biologists and uh, the machine learning experts. They want to help the uh, biologists apply some uh, data analysis tools to uh, 
analyze the information that they collected from the experiment or some other information uh, sources. So it is crucial for the analyst to have a clear understanding of the problem. Otherwise, uh, their tasks may be misinterpreted. And do they have a clear definition of the KDD goal? Whether you want to, class to do a classification on your data or clustering on your data, depending on what is your task, right? If your data doesn't have label, you want to see some natural grouping in your data, you may want to apply clustering technique. Right, you don't have label information. On the other hand, if you have some data that have labels and you want to use this label to help you to make some decision or prediction, you may want to use classification. So whether you choose supervised or unsupervised learning, depending on your data and your task. As also, uh, as I mentioned before, Selection and availability of relevant information is very important to uh, your analysis, especially for cases like criminal intelligence analysis, right? You need to understand whether you have gathered all the necessary information for your analysis. In many cases, this is uh, not uh, uh, true because it's very hard to gather all the necessary information for your analysis. So when you do perform your analysis, you need to bear in mind that there are some information that is missing. So when you evaluate your result, you have to take this into consideration. Okay. So next question is how to compare. This involves uh, quite a number of different uh, techniques. If we look at this uh, knowledge discovery process again, we will see we have to go through uh, pre-processing, transformation, data mining and human evaluation before we can generate some knowledge out of our data. So in my next slides, I'm going to go through each stage and give some example techniques that you can apply to do a similarity analysis and uh, discuss the associated um, uncertainty issues. So let's have a look at uh, pre-processing. So pre-processing is probably the most uh, time-consuming task in your knowledge discovery process. Uh, according to some statistics, maybe 90% of your time is uh, going to be spent on data pre-processing. So uh, depending on your data, there are different uh, uh, things that you may want to do. For example, data cleansing, data integration, data reduction. Data cleansing refers to the process of uh, handling missing values, smoothing noisy data, identifying or removing outliers in your data, or <laughs> resolving consistencies. Uh, data integration is uh, needed when you have data uh, that is collected from multiple sources, for example, multiple databases or data cubes, or you collect information from multiple files. Data reduction is uh, often used yeah. when uh, your data is too large. Basically, uh, it can't be uh, scaled to your data mining or visualization algorithms. In such a case, you want to reduce uh, the number of records in your data or number of attributes in your data using some specific techniques. So um, let's have an example of uh, missing value handling. This is a, a typical data pre-processing technique, often you Start, it with, uh, start your pre-processing with uh, uh, missing value handling. There are many different ways of handling missing values. So the most commonly uh, used ways uh, are listed, listed here. You can ignore the records that contain uh, missing values, or you can fill in the min, uh, missing value manually if you know what the missing values are, which is often not the case. Uh, you can use the global constant or attribute mean to fill in the missing value, or you can use the most probable value to fill in the missing value. This involves more ad, uh, advanced statistical method. So as you, if you look at all these uh, uh, ways of treating missing values, uh, they all introduce uncertainty to your analysis. Uh, first of all, if you ignore the records that contain missing value, that means you eliminate some of the information which may be relevant to your analysis. 
right? If you fill in the missing value with some approximation, the later four methods all involve some type of approximation, right? You fill in the missing value by a constant or attribute mean or pro most probable value. These are guessing, right? These are approximation. Approximation introduces uncertainty to your analysis because they are not, you can't guarantee these are the real values of your data. Uh, another, take, another thing is how uh, which technique to use. Of course, different uh, analysts may use different uh, techniques to handle missing values. This is uh, another uh, uncertainty issue if uh, two analysts or several analysts uh, using different technique to uh, work on the same uh, data set or same, same problem. Let's look at data transformation. Data, uh, often uh, the data has to be transformed before you can fit it into a data mining algorithm for pattern analysis. Okay, some examples I list here, normalization, discretization, uh, attribute feature construction. So normalization, uh, I will show you an example in my next slide. Normalization is to, uh, or very uh, often used when you have data uh, with multiple attributes and you want to compare your data across multiple attributes, right? Each attribute may have its own attribute, uh, own value range, and you want to make this value comparable. So this is what we call normalization. Discretization is often when you try to transform your data into categorical value, right? When you have data of people, you want to divide your data uh, into different age groups, or though you have an attribute value called age, you want to uh, give a label to age between 10 to 20 uh, uh, into one group, 20 to 40 to another, and so on and so forth. This is uh, what we call discretization, okay? Attribute feature construction, in some cases you need to aggregate cer uh, certain values in your data in order to derive new values. For example, if you want to uh, find the age of your people in your database, you may need to uh, compute the current date and the date of birth of uh, these people, right? If you want to compute the uh, library fine, you may need to look at both the due date and the current date and time it with uh, the a number of uh, the amount of fine for each day. So these are attribute uh, construction uh, process. In uh, image analysis uh, or video analysis cases, you may need to um, construct new features. For example, given an image, you may want to construct new features according to some uh, geometry properties, or you may want to uh, construct some new features according to their color uh, attribution, uh, attributes. So these are called attribute feature construction. So normalization, discretization, and uh, attribute feature construction is the process uh, called data transformation. Okay, you often need to, uh, to do, your, do this uh, data transformation before you can feed your data into a data mining algorithm. So normalization, as I said, uh, it is a uh, very uh, much needed when you have uh, to compare attribute values across uh, multiple uh, 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 attributes. So for, for, for instance, you have uh, some data about people. Here we see uh, three records of uh, three people. You record their age and height, and now you want to compare these people according to these two attribute values, age and height. As you can see, this is uh, quite difficult if you compare directly by comparing the numbers because the differences between ages uh, are quite uh, are much smaller than uh, the differences between height if you look at the uh, scale. So in this case, you want to fit your data uh, in different uh, data value in different attributes into a certain unified range, right? This is why we do normalization. So. 
if you look at this formal definition of uh, normalization, basically you have a set of statistical data, here we call it V, and you have a minimum value in the data called, here we call it mini, and you have a maximum value in the data here we call max. And um, normalization is the process of feeding the data into a function f, where f translate this value, any given value v in the data into a range between 0 and 1. In this case, a maximum value will be mapped to 1, and a minimum value will be mapped to 0. Okay, there, as you can imagine, there are a large number of functions that allow you to do this type of mapping. So I can start with uh, the most simple one, which is the linear transformation. So linear normalization, basically, if you look at the function here, given the value, uh, you transform it by subtract the minimum value from current value and divide it by the difference between the maximum, maximum value in your data and the minimum value in your data. So if you look at this example, I have three numbers here, 4, 16, and 64. Let's imagine this is my whole data set for an attribute, okay? All the values uh, for an attribute in my data. If you apply this linear normalization, you just uh, put this here, the V now is 4, 16, and 64 accordingly, right? So if you apply this formula, as you can see, we managed to fit the values into a range between 0 and 1. So 4 becomes 0, that's the minimum value. 64 become 1, that's the maximum value, and 16 is something in middle. So if we apply this formula, you will end up with a 0 0.2 for the second value. Naturally, there are many other ways that we can uh, transform our data or fit our data into the same range. So here I show you another example of square root normalization. Okay, square root normalization it's very similar to linear trans normalization, except that you use square root of all the values, current value, minimum value, and maximum value. So given the same data set, 4, 16, 64, if we ap apply square root normalization, we will end up with uh, the same values for uh, the maximum value 64 and the minimum value 4, but for the value in the middle, 16, now we transform it into 0 0.3333, right? Of course, there are other methods. Let's look at another example, logarithmic normalization. So you, you use the log to the base of 2 to normalize your data. Again, minimum value, maximum value are mapped to 0 to and 1 accordingly. But 16 now is mapped to 0 0.5 if you use logarithmic normalization. Okay, so my point is different normalization techniques give you different results. They map your data into different values. So which one to use and how do you understand? How do you transform such understanding to your analysis process, right? So what I can tell you this, this is an example of I map the um, normalized result into um, some applications. For example, here we have use U.S. population data by county. If I use a linear transformation or linear normalization, you can see um, most of the counties have very similar population after normalization. But if I use square root normalization, you see the bottom half has more variance uh, um, compared to the rest of the country. And if I use logarithmic normalization, you see a bigger variation among population in different counties in the United States. So each of these normalization techniques give you a different set of uh, result values. Okay, so the uncertainty here is which one to use, which one is the most appropriate technique to use and uh, um, what are these, uh, how do you interpret the result, right?
Now let's look at data reduction. Data reduction is now a, a very hot topic because of this big data problem, right? Often you have a lot of record, you have a lot of attributes, and so on and so forth. So traditional data mining algorithms often fail to uh, analyze such data due to uh, their scalability. So different methods were uh, invented or proposed to handle this um, scalability problem and data reduction is one of them. So data reduction, as you can see, you can reduce data uh, from two directions. First, you can reduce the number of uh, um, record in your data. This, a typical example would be sampling, right? Uh, if you have a large network of one million people, if you want to visualize it or do whatever uh, analysis on it, it's pretty uh, much impossible. So you have to do sampling. You try to sample a, represent, a represent, representative subset of data in order to be able to analyze it to see the pattern and structure in your data. Another direction is to reduce the dimensionality of your data. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, methods such as PCA, right? You, beta, you Basically, you try, try to reduce the dimensionality of your data by uh, com uh, compressing your data or transforming your data in some way uh, to generate a lower dimensional represent, uh, representation of your data of your high dimensional data. So, uh, so in, in terms of reducing number of records in your data, so the most commonly used technique, as I said, is sampling. You, choose, you try to choose a representative subset of the data record. So the most intuitive one uh, is uh, sim simple random sampling, so giving a large number of sample, you just randomly select a subset of uh, uh, observations in your data for your analysis. Of course, uh, for some, uh, there are many, many other sampling techniques. Here I give you another example, which is often applied for uh, business intelligence. So suppose you have a, a large number of client data to analyze, and they are based on different regions or ethnic groups and you want to uh, make sure that your data is representative to this uh, kind of grouping uh, structure. So what you can do is you can uh, actually uh, segment your data according to uh, their grouping and then do simple random sampling on each of the subgroups in your data, right? There are more uh, sophisticated sampling techniques such as clustering or um, uh, some other uh, statistical uh, uh, method, but I'm not going to uh, go through all these techniques. The message here is uh, which reduction technique to use and how do you make sure the data is well represented after reduction. Especially in some cases, now we are talking about um, infrequent but significant patterns in your data. There are some observations that are very significant in terms of their impact, but on the other hand, they don't occur very often in your data. Imagine you have a large data set and you do sampling on your data before you analyze it. How do you make sure these uh, infrequent but significant observations are represented? This is another uncertainty question that you need to bear in mind. So let's move on now to uh, data mining, similarity analysis, right? Similarity analysis, uh, for this tutorial, I made, it, uh, made the definition very narrow. I, I will focus on similarity computation and visualization. However, in a broader sense, there are many other data mining techniques that can be considered as similarity analysis. For example, clustering, right? You want to compare the similarity between your objects and see the grouping based on their similarity. So this is clustering. Classification can also be considered as similarity analysis because basically you assign objects that are similar to a, a, a labeled data the same label, right? This is also, in a broader sense, similarity analysis. But for this tutorial, 
due to time issue, we are only going to focus on the similarity computation and similarity visualization. Okay, so as we said, we want to compare similarity between our objects. Uh, for example, we have this data here. Uh, we can't just judge by looking at it, especially uh, if our data is large, right? We want to have some quantitative measure between the similar, uh, uh, about the similarity between pairwise objects in our data. Okay, this is uh, often achieved by uh, using some uh, similarity or distance metric uh, that are uh, uh, that that can be used uh, uh, to to compare the the similarity. So we often encounter two type of definitions. One is similarity; the other is dissimilarity. This is probably an inherent problem between the uh, metric design. Often some metrics are designed for measure similarity, some are designed for measure distance. For example, Euclidean distance uh, was not uh, initially designed for uh, similarity analysis. They are used uh, for geometry, uh, geometric uh, analysis, but later it's adopted for similarity analysis. So in this case, we have distance or in other words, uh, we can use this distance as dissimilarity measure, right? Often after normalization in, in many uh, um, applications, we just regard similarity to be one minus uh, uh, dissimilarity. And naturally, when we have small distance between two objects, we say they are similar. And large distance between two uh, objects, we will consider them to be dissimilar. So uh, I'm sure you all know this. Uh, Euclidean distance, uh, basically the straight line between two points at a 2D plane or even um, more 3D, 4D. So the computation is very simple. You take the square root of the uh, distance uh, of the uh, pairwise uh, attribute values uh, to the power of two uh, summed. So basically this is uh, Euclidean distance. So imagine you have a 3D space, you may have Z, and then you plus Z2 minus Z1 to the power of 2, right? And if you have a fourth or fifth dimension, you can do exactly the same. So Euclidean distance is not uh, limited to 2D. And as a matter of fact, uh, Euclidean distance is one of the most commonly used uh, technique of uh, uh, distance measure for uh, many algorithms and it's often set as defaults uh, for um, comparison. I will come back to this point a bit later. So in terms of uh, similarity measure or distance measure, there's a large body of research and uh, many different measures have, to, have been designed to suit different needs. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, data value, type of data values, uh, for instance, you have distance measure uh, for numerical values. Uh, for example, uh, you can use Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance. And sometimes uh, correlations are also used for measuring distance or similarity. For example, Pearson's uh, correlation is uh, also widely used for distance measure. Uh, for text strengths, you can have added distance or sometimes cosine distance uh, for uh, comparison. It, when you have categorical value, you may want to apply overlap measures. And uh, often when you have large data sets that have many attributes and you have attributes of a mixture of numerical, categorical, or text field, you may want to use a goal distance, uh, which means you treat attributes uh, differently, use different uh, um, measures to uh, measure different t attribute type. For example, you use Euclidean distance to measure your numerical values. You use uh, edit distance to uh, measure your uh, textual uh, fields. And then you combine them in some way via a uh, Gore distance. So um, as I said, you can have different distance measure. But on the other hand, different dif distance measure give you different results. So now let's look at these three examples. We have two data points, A and B. If we apply Euclidean distance, the distance represents the straight line between these two points in a, two, in a 2D plane, right? A and B. 
But on the other hand, if we if we apply the hyper distance, this will be these two lines summed the distance of these two lines from A to uh, the parallel uh, uh, line to uh, y x and then B the parallel uh, line to the x axis. So this is a different value you end up with. And if you use cosine distance, it's actually the cosine value of this theta angle between A and B. So each difference, uh, each distance measure give you a different result, right? So the uncertainty question is, which one to use and how do you interpret it? As you can see, now you see a pattern for every technique I ask the same question. Which one to use and how do you interpret the result? Okay, so last, this is the bit that interests us the most, visualization of a similarity, right? If you have 2D data, it's very easy. You just map them into a 2D plane. But if you have multidimensional data, which you have a dimensionality bigger than two, how do you show the similarity between objects in an intuitive way such that the analyst can easily see patterns like groups and outliers. Well, the good news is you can do this. So via um, the, some technique uh, that called dimensionality reduction or force-based, uh, uh, force-directed uh, graph drawout, they can also be used as alternatives to dimensionality reduction. Again, this will be a separate tutorial and uh, I'm not going to talk into details about this. So the basic idea of projection is to map the data as a scatter plot in such a way that similar items are close to each other and dissimilar items are far apart, right? In this case, my x, y axis don't have a real meaning. They are not directly uh, associated to any of these attributes in the data. But the distance in my um, scatter plot represents similarities between objects. Okay, so how can you do this? So basically, given a distance, uh, given a data, here I have uh, n times m, m dimensional uh, data, so you have m attributes and items. Basically, you can apply the ending of the distance measure I introduced before to compute the distance between pairwise objects or pairwise up items in your data. Then you will end up with a distance matrix, and then you can use this distance matrix to, uh, you can fit this distance matrix into a dimensionality reduction technique to generate lower dimensional representation of your data. For visualization purpose, we generate often 2D or 3D representation of the data because as you can see, then we can use these uh, 2D numbers uh, as coordinates in our visual space and then we can use this to map our data to a 2D visual space. Okay, so this is an example I generated for our uh, fruit data. So basically, this is uh, often uh, what, what you see as a result of a distance computation. Basically, if you fit in a, a data matrix into your analysis tool, uh, you will often end up with a distance matrix like this. As you can see, uh, it's symmetric, so I uh, omitted half of this matrix. So basically, there are certain rules. For example, a dis the distance between an object to itself is zero, and the distance uh, between object uh, A and B is the same as the distance between object B and A. So in this case, you only need half of the matrix to uh, represent all the distance or similarity between objects in your data. So this can be fed into an algorithm to generate this 2D uh, representation of your data, and then you can use the result to map your fruit into a 2D coordinate. And that result will give you a much better impression than this one, which fruits are similar, which fruits may form a group based on your data, right? So there are a large number of dimensionality reduction techniques that you can apply. 
And the, the most commonly used ones are uh, PCA or um, MDAs, principal component analysis, or uh, multidimensional scaling. Uh, but the, in recent years, there are some more uh, uh, algorithms that are proposed. For example, uh, TSNE is now quite popular. So um, for this talk, I only want to use a PCA as an example. So I guess many of you have already uh, learned or used PCA before, right? So I'm not going to go, go to too much details. Basically, PCA, you transform your data uh, take, uh, take a data matrix of n objects by uh, p variables, which may be correlated, and then you summarize it uh, by uncorrelated axes. Basically, you ro rotate your axis in such a way to uh, best, uh, uh, maximize the variance uh, in your data among these axes. And then you take the first uh, k components, because they display as much uh, as possible of the variation among objects. So um, this gives you this uh, 2D projection scatter plot visualization of your data that show the patterns. Um, again, uh, we have uh, associated uncertainty questions, for example, which one to use. And another thing is uh, for a lower dimensional representation of high dimensional data, you often need to bear in mind the data structure cannot be 100% preserved in the lower dimensional representation. So you have to distort your data in some way uh, so you can compress your data into lower dimension. So how are you going to um, analyze the quality of your result, right, of your lower dimensional projection? Of course, there are a number of measures that you can apply, for example, stress measure, or um, some other uh, uh, canary uh, measure, but uh, how do you interpret these measures? And also another question for visualization is, when you project your high dimensional data to a visual representation, you want to have good visual quality, right? You want to see clear separation between groups. So in some cases, some algorithms give you beta group separation, but they distort the data uh, more. So in this case, how do you understand the compromise, or how do you decide the compromise between visual quality and the projection quality? So in one, uh, on the one hand, you want to generate a good visual quality projection so you can uh, see the patterns. On the other hand, you want the projection to uh, truly reflect the original structure of your data. So how do you uh, make the trade-off between these two? This is another issue. So now we come to the final stage of the knowledge discovery process, evaluation. So this is not my area of expertise. I guess Alex, Simon, they already give you uh, some tutorials uh, yesterday or uh, the day before yesterday about uh, knowledge discovery, human perception, and what kind of uh, calculative bias you can uh, introduce to your analysis process. And if you uh, think about it, this could also be an uncertainty issue, right? So. Um, this is a very brief tutorial, so I just want to give you a flavor of uh, you know, how uncertain our analysis can be. And the take home message is, data analysis techniques and tools are useful, but uncertainties exist at every stage of the process. So you need to be aware of the uncertainties, and in order to be aware of it, you have to understand the techniques first. So in a, a lot of visual analytics system or data analysis systems, uh, you have default settings, right? Often uh, uh, the analyst, uh, especially if they're not data mining expert, they go for the default settings. And they just, uh, if, if the default setting gives them some result they like, they will take it. Otherwise, they try some other options. Uh, but the, the most important thing is, you need to understand the underlying technique uh, in order to uh, 
best uh, interpret the result. Otherwise, you may be misled by your data mining result. Right? This is the uh, most important thing. Another thing is um, the advantage of visual uh, analytics is that uh, we involve human in the analysis loop. Right? Human have their domain knowledge. They have a good understanding about the domain problem and about the analysis task. So you have to uh, you have to look at the data and give feedback to uh, these analysis results in in order to uh, support uh, your decision making. So often when we talk about visual an uh, analysis system, uh, they are decision making support tools. They don't make decision for you. They support your decision making. So for your analysis uh, task, you need to uh, look at the data, but you don't, uh, you, you can't fully trust uh, the data analysis result. You have to evaluate the result yourself before you make a decision uh, based on the data. So this is uh, basically the uh, end of this talk. I'm happy to take questions. Lishi, uh, thank you very much for a very, very clear talk. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's provoked lots of, uh, lots of thinking. Uh, has it provoked questions? They're stunned. They're all for coffee. <laughs> yes, Alex. at more of a, of a level about an introduction in general, sort of mm -hmm. where you see the, uh, the, the science in that area going, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's many different techniques to use, and they all have their trade-offs and things like that. Uh, do you see sort of new avenues for dimensional reduction that maybe overcome a little bit of this interpretability and trust and, and some of those issues? Uh, do you see any of that emerge? Uh, yeah, well, that's a very good question because I, I was uh, working on this <laughs> this week's submission on <laughs> uh, in, interactive uh, uh, visual dimensionality reduction, and we kind of touched uh, a little bit uh, on this issue, although the uncertainty or quality is a very big, uh, wide area that we couldn't really in uh, include every aspect of it. Uh, the thing is... Um, Again, you have to uh, kind of uh, design, uh, uh, in, in our uh, paper we pointed out this, um, for, uh, for, for this uh, quality of uh, uh, dimensionality reduction. Often, uh, you know, for many system, uh, older system, they uh, provide dimensionality reduction techniques that you can fit your data and then you generate a 2D uh, a scatter plot visualization of your data. However, um, the analysts don't directly see the quality associated to it. There are some later uh, systems who addressed this issue by uh, generating multiple uh, generating multiple uh, visual embedding of uh, the same data using different techniques and indicate uh, the quality measures of them. So the analyst can compare the quality and decide uh, which one to use for their analysis or look at the data from uh, different perspectives. This could be a, a very uh, useful uh, solution to that. There are also some other uh, techniques that map the uh, distortion level in a local area of, uh, I'm sure you know that paper. I think that's also a very good starting point of addressing this problem because you can have a kind of a background information about what is the uncertainty associated to this projection. Alicia, I have a question, yeah. uh, and that is, it's clear from your, uh, your your talk that there are consequences of the decisions that we make mm -hmm. uh, as, we, as we move along. And so uh, as designers, um, do we think uh, that we can design systems which can enable people to avoid the knowledge required to make those sorts of decisions? Or, or do we need to think about a new kind of um, uh, visual analytics literacy uh, uh, which you're giving 
to, to people in order to enable them to make those, those, those kinds of decisions and understand the consequences of what they're doing? Uh, you mean highlight uh, the uh, uncertainties in your uh, analysis process? So uh, I, I, th I think what I mean is um, when we think about the, the user and we mm -hmm. model the user, mm -hmm. do we accept that they don't necessarily know what uh, the you know, data transformation implications are and we try and avoid them having to have that knowledge? Or do we just say we're not designing for users who don't understand this kind of thing and we need to um, um, uh, give them a kind of literacy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer to this because, I, I, yeah, actually, I think it is the case often uh, the visual uh, analytic system assumes the user already have good knowledge and understanding about these background technologies. Uh, but uh, what I heard from some domain users, especially the biologists, they often say, you know, they use the default setting, right? Uh, <laughs> default setting uh, may not be the most appropriate setting for your analysis task and your data. This is uh, actually a very difficult problem, uh, and I think we're still waiting for, for answers, uh, in my view. Right. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, I, I, I think about um, the end users that we, that we uh, um, uh, who, who we engage with, and uh, I, I think of um, uh, police officers and Kieran, you, you, you deal with peace, police officers who uh, may need to use these sorts, this sort of data, and so th um, uh, these, these sort of systems. And so maybe there are, uh, you know, there's a, a, there are, what are the prospects for, for sort of for them? Are they engaging with issues like this end users? And what are the prospects that they might when they've got lots of other things to worry about as well? Did you like to um, tell us where the computer system in the morning? like to uh, look on the, uh, the intranet in the morning and, and, and um, look at graphs and charts and tables and, and then they interpret it themselves and say whether they think there needs to act on, on this and do it. So as we move into the future and have more of this um, visual analytics that we look at and give them even more information, there, there is data that they will interpret it and do it for them. And we need somebody to, 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 to well, people to push themselves to be a data scientist and then maybe people like Analysts need to have some um, literacy and some understanding of how that data is being provided and any uncertainties in it so that we can then convey that in a way which for our customers understand. And I don't think the customers will ever really understand it. Not so much that they don't have time, but their focus is on we've got to make a decision now. So if that's what they do all the time, they don't have time to dwell on these issues and think about, well, you know, if, if, they, if they have an accident in midair and they're really upset that they can't do this quiz according to the Simplify the, the interfaces. If we lose that um, description, if we lose detailed information, it doesn't help them make decisions anyway. So yeah. it makes more sense. Also, yeah, there's a, a, I absolutely agree. And also, there's a very interesting uh, and promising uh, direction in visual analytics research is uh, the so called semantic interaction. So, for instance, we project all the uh, cr crime cases on the screen. And the analyst can look into the details, and they can put two crimes that they think uh, similar closer to each other. Or if they think these two are not similar, they can pull them apart. And then our background computation, actually, it's one of your work, right, Alex? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, um, this kind of semantic interaction actually take user feedback and uh, knowledge into the uh, analysis pro process and kind of, you know, uh, back uh, reverse engineering the computation based on this knowledge. So this way you can actually in, in, uh, improve the an uh, effectiveness of your analysis because uh, the data analysis, data mining techniques are fixed. They kind of, they're more generic in some way. They are, they are designed to handle any data. They treat all the attribute values uh, equally, but, uh, you know, this type of semantic interaction let the uh, analyst who are not a uh, data mining expert uh, interact with the result and provide feedback to the uh, uh, data mining 
uh, process. So that that's kind of very a very promising uh, research area. And I think more people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you can tell that, that ideally you can also tell the, 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 the visualization is wrong, right? These points, these two points should be far apart. And then you just pull them far apart and then the uh, automatic analysis should be able to correct their uh, result based on your input. So this is... Uh, and it's very intuitive. So yeah, I think uh, we need more work in, <laughs> in, in this area. I, I sort of inadvertently prompted a, uh, an early panel discussion there, I think. <laughs> but Alex will save us from information literacy <laughs> yes. through semantic interaction. No pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any other uh, any other questions? I'm sorry, I, I moved away from the detail of the of, of the talk. But are there any other any questions for Lucy? Yeah, there's a question. Well, I think we're we're ready for coffee. Yeah. Uh, in that case, uh, but what I will do, uh, Lucy, I don't know why, but whenever uh, I, I get to this part of the panel. Um, uh, I always seem to assess whether I think that the person I'm giving a whiskey tumbler to is a whiskey drinker, and I'm not sure whether you are, but um, uh, but this is our engraved whiskey glass, so thank you for oh, the thank presentation. You so much.